I want to welcome you to the Chattanooga First Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are delighted that you are tuning in today and that you're joining us for worship. And I want to also remind you that tonight at 7 p.m., that you can join us for HopeAwakens.com. We have It Is Written that has put together an evangelistic series this spring that is in over 650 churches, over 70,000 people have registered and signed up, and you can do the same at HopeAwakens.com. You can join us tonight at 7 p.m. as we continue the series. We uh, have been here, well, it's a couple of weeks since we've been together. And uh, you would think in the midst of this uh, COVID-19, where this disease is spread all throughout the, the world, that that was, that was enough. But those that live in the Chattanooga area know that right in our backyard, there was an F3 tornado that ripped through this city. And I just want to take a moment to uh, thank those who have gotten out of help their fellow church members, help complete strangers by, you know, handing out bottles of water, handing out burritos, boarding up the sides of windows, tarping roofs, taking a chainsaw and cutting out a path so people can get out of their houses, um, digging up stumps. You know, we dug up stumps, lots of stumps, cut down trees, all kinds of things to be able to help one another out and help the community. If you want to help out some, we're joining an organization called crisiscleanup.com. And uh, you can join us. We're even going to be out tomorrow continuing to help folk here in the Chattanooga area. So please uh, connect with Marion. You have her contact information at chatfirstsda at gmail.com. We want to remind you uh, that on our website, there is an online giving tutorial so that if you'd like to contribute to our organization here at Chattanooga First, you can do so by an Adventist giving app. It can be found at Google Play or at the Apple Store. And the tutorial video shows you how to click the right buttons there. And we appreciate your tithes and offerings. Our church board met this past week over the phone and the finances were doing good in the midst of this. And I just give God praise for that. And we want to, you know, we want to pray for the folk. We want to thank uh, the healthcare workers that are out there ministering on those front lines. We want to pray for those that are unemployed, and we want to, we want to speak to the hearts of men and women today. You know, there are people that are, have had accidents in our church, broken bones. They have suffered death of loved ones, and what touched my heart was this message. When bad things happen to good people, and so this goes out from my heart. Um, seeking words of comfort and hope from the Scriptures to uplift and give you courage. I invite you to pray with me just now. Heavenly Father, we want to see another miracle. We want to invite you, the God of the universe, the one who sits on your throne that sees and hears and knows the pain and the suffering and the challenges that not only our members are facing, this entire community is facing. And we pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would, would speak this morning, that your word would come alive and it would register through the internet into the… Well, actually, you don't even need the internet. You're going to reach out and touch the hearts and the lives of people as they hear this message. And I pray that it would give them courage, that it would give them hope, and that it would give them strength. In Jesus' name, amen. So 
Thank you, Vanessa. We appreciate that. The sermon and song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Almighty God, you've chosen to speak to us through prophets, through wise leaders, and most clearly through your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant us now the ability to hear, to understand, and to obey Him whom you've sent. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know what I saw? I saw something that few people really ever see in life. Many of you will experience this, but you'll never see it. It happened when I was at a hospital right here in Chattanooga. I was taking a chaplaincy course, and part of the idea of the course was is to learn how you minister to patients. When you go into the room, I mean, they're, they're suffering, they're in pain. How do, how do you minister to the very different uh, patients that you're going to meet on any given hospital visit? And so they have a class, and the hospitals believe in this, and they're, they're teaching pastors, how do you minister in a hospital room? Well, one of the teachers that we had, was, his name was Terry. He was a, one of the chaplains. He was a great chaplain, just a great guy. And I was assigned to go to Terry because he was going to help me with one of my requirements. I had to, as a part of this course, requirements, I had to witness a surgery. And as we went and we looked at the board, there was all kinds of different surgeries going on. And, and there was one Terry thought that I needed to go to. It was, it was a, um, a gallbladder surgery, you know, that lapendectomy where you kind of come in. I'm like, you know, Terry, I, I really appreciate that. But if we're going to see a surgery, let's see a real surgery. I mean, I, you got an open heart surgery? And sure enough, there was an open heart surgery going on. He said, well, it's halfway through. Do you really want to do that one and say, well, if we're going to see one, let's, let's, let's see a surgery. And so they got me uh, into the room there. You know, you clean your hands really, really good and clean them again and put on a, on a, on a mask and there was a gown, there was a thing over your head. You, you couldn't even recognize me. And they escorted me to the room and I got in the room and the first thing was the nurse was there said, hi, Rusty, how you doing? I'm like, how can you even recognize me? But she had read my name. It was Tantra Pool. I grew up with her. She was a nurse there at the hospital. She was working. She says, hey, how you doing? And then no sooner had I gotten over that, that, that Beverly said, hey, Rusty, how you doing? I'm like, Beverly? She used to ride horses with my mother. And so, you know, we get done talking to her and, and Mark, he introduced himself. He was the perfusionist, you know, where the, where the blood is kind of piped into the machine and oxygenated and put back into the person so that they can stay alive while they do the open heart surgery. He says, hi. I'm Mark, and I'm from the other side. And I'm like, I'm like oh, okay, you know, what is, what is that about? And, and Mark went on to tell that he really was from the other side. He wasn't from my side. He actually um, worshiped the devil. That's what he said. Now, you'd think he was joking, but from what I understand from other perfusionists, um, it was, he was dead serious. Um, so here I am. And, you know, I'm in, in the heart surgery room, and, and we have all this stuff going on. And I, I finally kind of get settled down. Here is the, the patient that is there. And um, I saw what was just absolutely incredible. Inside is the heart. And it, it was stopped. The, the, the doctors were operating. They were, had taken a, a slice of vein out of, out of the leg, and they were sewing it in. And and they were making sure that it didn't leak. And I'm like, oh my, my. And they're doing all this stuff. And I'm like, I was very impressed with what they were doing to be able to help this woman live. Well, as I was there, the room began to get warmer and warmer and warmer. And I decided, you know, maybe I think I'll go outside and get a drink. And uh, that's definitely a, a reason why I didn't choose to go into the medical profession. Uh, but I went outside, I got a drink, gathered up my courage, went back in, and we finished the operation. There was a, you know, they put the, the little spoon-like paddles down in, and then, and the heart began to beat again. Pretty incredible to be able to see that kind of a surgery, and how God has had advances in medicine to be able to see, uh, help people live again. Who would have died without this operation? Pretty incredible stuff. But you know what else I saw? 
I saw a guy by the name of Frazier. Now we've changed all the names because you never know who knows people here. But to Mr. Frazier, I've been called to go to the room and Mr. Frazier was there and he was inside of the room. And while he was there in the room, I, I came in and, and he, he was resting very peacefully, um, looked good. Um, everything was great except for one thing. He wasn't breathing. He too had had an operation and as he had gone through the operation, he did not survive the operation. And I had been called as a chaplain to be able to help the family as they came in to see him for the first time since he had passed away. Now, let me tell you something. That's one of the most private moments in life where people are grieving, where people are, you know, dealing with some of the, you know, they just lost their father. They just lost their loved one. And it's one of those times where you don't say anything. You'd think that you would say something in that situation, but that was the lesson that I learned, just to be with them, just to be with them and to not deal with anything, to be able to just hug them and cry with them, not have to say anything. It's one of the lessons that I learned but as I got to thinking, I wanted to know why this man passed away and why that woman lived. I had a real question about that. What, what was the deciding factor? I mean, was this a bad man? Was he, you know, being punished? Um, and, and as you're going through that situation there, I began to think, was supernatural forces coming into play? And after all, if there were supernatural forces, why didn't the woman pass away? Because after all, that was the devil-worshipping perfusionist. And I began to put all these things together. And, and, and you begin to ask the question that many people ask, why do bad things happen to good people? And I want to take a look at that today. I want to take a look at the answer to that question. Because when we take a look at the situation here with a tornado that's come through the backyard and... We find folk that are hurting, broken limbs and broken bones. You wonder, there's a lot of good people, and you wonder why these things happen. And today, I want to take a look at the words of Scripture to see if we can understand why these bad things happen. So join with me. We're going to take a look at the book of Job, Job chapter 1. But before we get there, Psalm chapter 121 says this. It says, today... <clears throat> Psalm chapter 121 and verse 1, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who created heaven and earth. And so I want you to know this morning, I left my bag of magic tricks at home. I don't have any magic here today. I don't have any hocus pocus to try to make things better. What I do have is this, I find hope in this passage that when trouble comes, our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Notice that it doesn't say that my pain comes from the Lord. It says my help comes from the Lord. You know, Job's friends, they, um, they dropped by and they thought that, you know, Job had done something wrong. You remember the story. And, and it, if you've read the book of Job, it's, it's a long book. It's 40 different chapters. When you start getting to chapter 3 and 4, you, that's when Job's friends start coming over. And they're there until chapter 38. The bulk of the book of Job is his friends coming over and saying, No, Job, surely you, you've done something wrong. I mean, seriously, why would you do this? Why, how, how could all this stuff happen if, if you didn't do something in fact, it isn't too long in the story. We see even Job's wife encouraged him to curse God and to die. But that's not the appropriate response, is it? In June 13, 1999, I was traveling down I-75. And um, we were going down the highway there. And the road came to a stop. We were going to Pine Mountain Valley, 
And when we were going down through there, we, we couldn't go any further. And so we got off the road and we went another direction and made it on down to the church. We had a baseball game down there and had a lot of fun just kind of hanging out and, um, you know, having a good time. Ate, ate some ice cream, all those kinds of things. And after we got done, we realized why the traffic had stopped. We realized that something had happened. And we didn't really figure it out until there was a newspaper that came out. And that was, that was back in the day when you found the um, information, not on the internet, but, you know, on the news or, or a newspaper. And there was a newspaper article that was actually written by a lady by the name of Kathy Sledge. And her article was entitled, In Tragedy, Get Beyond the Wise and Let Yourself Grieve. And so it was a general intent of the article was good. But, you know, what had happened is, is there had been a, a van that was driven by good people, church-going folk that went to the St. James CME Church. They were returning to Columbus from a retreat in Augusta. And something had happened. The van overturned, and three of the children were killed. Eight of the others, all eight of the others were injured. Janice Jordan, 14, Jonathan Lyles, 13, and Cecil Jernigan, 12, they, they all perished that day. Three children just snuffed out, 12, 13, and 14 years of age, and the community was grieving. And so Kathy, he wrote this article entitled, Get beyond the whys and let yourself grieve. And, you know, the general intent of the article was fine. She went through and described some of the grieving process and things like that. And as she got down to the last point there of the grieving process, I mean, she is really kind of spelled it out. Grief equals pain. And as I've studied, you know, in the chaplaincy course, one of uh, the books that we had, Lawrence Holst, basically divides grieving up into just two stages. Some people divide it up into seven stages. There's all kinds of things. I like the one that's just simple, two stages. Uh, resistance and acceptance. And Lawrence Holst said this, that resistance is denial, anger, bargaining, depression, um, all of these things can, can be a, a factors in the resistance as we're like thinking, I, I can't believe this happened. Uh, a bargain with God. Please, if, if you could just help me out of the situation, Lord, you know, please. All of these things. And then there comes the point at which you accept it. Lawrence says that acceptance isn't forgetting, but remembering without the piercing pain. And so that takes a long time to realize that this has happened and now we must go through it and figure out how to cope with life now that this has happened. And so these were some of the aspects that were mentioned in the article. And, um, but when she got down to the last point, I was absolutely shocked at the conclusion. Because she said this, and I, I'm still shocked by it, and I hope you are too. She said, there's no good way to get through this. Just do the best that you can. You know, weep. Wail out loud if it helps. Curse God. It's okay. You can't shatter God. God is God, and He knows what you're going through. And I was just like, you know, that, it, he, you read that, and just something kind of starts turning in your, in your stomach, and, and you begin to think about it, and you're like, no, really, I, I, I've got to call on this one. I've got to figure this out. And so it wasn't really Kathy that had done that. She quoted a pastor uh, Doug Turley, retired Episcopal priest. And so I called up Pastor Turley. I said, hey, this is Pastor Rusty Williams, Pine Mountain Valley, Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, you know, I, I read your article. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to call and see if I understood correctly, you know, what you were saying. Um, did, did you really say, curse God? It's okay? And he went on about, you know, in, in the interview, there's a lot of things that you know, are kind of cut out and kind of, you know, are left there on the floor. And he, he, he didn't deny it, but he didn't really explain it either. And so I just kind of said, you know, <laughs> I'm not so sure. Um, and I expressed my concern about, you know, encouraging people to curse God, especially when you have a story in the Bible 
about Job, where Job would have sinned if he cursed God, and yet he didn't curse God, he worshiped him. I invite you to turn with me to Job chapter 1, and we're going to take a look at the story here. And as we go through it, I wanted to kind of highlight some of the things that are there. First of all, as a congregation, we need to realize that that behind the scenes there was something going on that Job had no idea of. We see that there was a day, verse 6, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, so where do you come from? And Satan said, well, I've been going all over the, the earth, going to and fro here and there. And God said, well, surely if you've been all over the earth, you've seen my servant Job. I mean, he's a righteous man. He's good. Everything that he does, he's blameless. And Satan answered back and said, well, does Job fear God for nothing? You have put a hedge of protection around him. Isn't it interesting, when you take a look at this passage, you see a lot of information that is given here. There is a hedge around Job. And there's a conversation going on about how that he's blameless, and Satan says, look, you know, just, just lift that hedge up a little bit. Let me, um, let me take a, a swipe at him. And so God does this. He says, all right. He says, you can do that, but just don't touch him. So God signs off on what is about to happen to Job. Job doesn't know this, but God signs off and he gets, he sets limits. He says, don't touch him. And the Bible says that there was a time when the oxen, 500 oxen were, were out in the fields. They were plowing. There was 500 donkeys also out there feeding. And the Sabians came down and raided and took them all away. Now, that was cash back in the day. If you wanted to Talk about how wealthy, you know, you didn't say, hey, look at my Ferrari or hey, look at this wonderful house or these, you know, this, this bank account. No, it was, it was, it was in, in cattle and donkeys and all this. And, and Job was a wealthy person. He had 500 of these. Now it's all gone. Sheep. He had 7,000 sheep. And the Bible says fire fell down from God out of heaven. So what we find here. Is, is that's just kind of weird. What, do we see fire today? Well, we really do. Some of us today, we call it lightning. There was a lightning strike, came down and killed 7,000 sheep. And then we find the Chaldeans came down and they stole the camels, all 3,000 of them. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was wealthy, I wouldn't be buying any camels. I guarantee you that. But back in the day, it was a sign, and I don't know what they did with him, but, but he had 3,000 of them, and they were all gone. But the thing that grabs your heart and mine is the 10 children were in a house, and the Bible says a whirlwind came and destroyed the house. It struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young men, and they were all dead. And I don't know about you, but when I read whirlwind strikes the house, and all four corners fall in, I'm thinking tornado. I'm thinking a destructive whirlwind was allowed to take place. And what we find is that Job did not curse God. In fact, he did the very opposite. He worshiped God. And I don't know the whole thinking. All I'm doing is telling the story. And I realize that, that Job here, as he's looking at this, does not see the conversation that is going on behind the scenes, but that God has somehow has signed off on this. And it happened. And the whole thing was, was whether God would curse him or whether he would worship him. And so the scene changes, and it's back in heaven again. And you see... Lucifer, and he was coming along, and he was uh, meeting God there, and God says, so, so who are you? Where, where, where do you come from? And he's like, well, he says, I've been going all over to, to and fro, all over the face of the earth. Same storyline as before. He says, well, surely you've seen my servant Job. And I can just see God kind of, kind of rubbing it in. I mean, he's righteous and blameless, and, and it just kind of pushed Satan's buttons, and he said, skin for skin. Let me touch his skin. 
And he will curse you to your face. And God, again, allows it, but then sets a limit. Says you can touch him, but don't kill him. And you know the story. He came down with with horrible boils and uh, affected him from the top of his head all the way down to the soles of his feet. But it gets a little worse. His wife came out. And I want to be very careful here because I don't know that she won't be in heaven because of this. What I do know is this, at a moment of, of, of utter grief, when she has lost all 10 of her children and her husband is going through this, she listens to a whisper in her ear and mouths the same words that Satan was hoping that Job would say, just curse God and die. We don't know why this happened, but I dare say that this Bible story is there for those that have suffered very similar situations and that there are circumstances beyond what we can see. And while we're going through it, we're just like Job. But thank God he put this story here because we can see that there's something going on behind that we don't understand. And as we go through this, I hope that there is something something that will help as we study this to be able to help us all through these situations because either you've had a situation like this or you're in one right now or you're going to go through one and so we can help each other here you know I want to remind folk that there is a passage in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 that says whatsoever a man sows he shall also reap Chapters, you know, three and following, you know, chapter four, Eliphaz shows up and, 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 and all of his friends, and they go through this whole thing. Job, surely you sinned. Job, Job, you must, Job, this doesn't happen. Surely. But Job never sinned. And we receive, read this New Testament passage in Galatians chapter six and verse seven that says, whatsoever a man sows, therefore he shall also reap. But this does not set a cause and effect relationship for all events because this isn't the only passages in Scripture that we have been given. It only states that sinful behavior will have negative results, and that is true. I mean, if you smoke cigarettes, it's not going to be a far cry that you could develop emphysema, cancer, you know, COPD, um, uh, one of a number of different things, emphysema. But there are folk out there like George Burns. I mean, he lived to be over 100 years old. And people would say, George, you need to stop smoking. And he would just (sighs) take a cigarette out of his mouth and say, well, you know, my doctor told me to stop smoking. (laughs) But he's dead. And then they would laugh and laugh and laugh. George Burns represents a statistical case of about 3% of folk that can smoke until they're over 100 years old and never die. But I want you to think about that. That's a 3% shot. (laughs) I'm not going to gamble on that. And uh, I will guarantee you that if you're serious and you want to quit, it doesn't have to be smoking, it can be drinking, it can be all a number of different things, that God will help you. He helped me 30 years ago. And I haven't put one in my mouth for 30 years. You can do it through the grace of God. And to be able to help out in situations like that. But there's another story I want to keep in mind. Because not only is there the principle, what you sow, you will reap. There's also a sticky other principle that almost flies in the face. In fact, it does. It comes to us in John chapter 9. A story that I am so glad is in the Bible. And I want you to turn with me and kind of, kind of go through it. Because it, it comes at it from a much different angle than Job's friends were coming at it. Job chapter, I'm sorry, John chapter 9, you find the story of the blind man. And we find that there was a question that was posed by the disciples. And I just love this question because it's, it's, it so points out the humanity in people's lives. The disciples are walking along and there's the blind guy. Everybody knows the blind guy. He always comes out, he always begs right there at that particular place. 
And so as they're walking along, these disciples are under the tutelage of Jesus. And they are learning from him. They're learning all kinds of things. And as they're going along, here's the, the creator of the universe. And the disciples say, Master, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answered and said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. From the disciples' point of view, there wasn't a question about sin. It was just like, they were curious. Was it the blind man or maybe his parents that he was born? And Jesus shortcharges the, 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 the whole question and said, well, neither. Neither this man nor his parents, but that the glory of God would be revealed. And then he does something different. And he goes over to the blind man and says, hey, come over here. And he does something really awkward. He, he just kind of gets down and, and he, he scoops up some of the, the dust here. And I want you to just think about this. He spits in his hand and starts making clay out of saliva and dirt and then wipes it all over the man's eyes and tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man goes over and he washes. And as he's washing, he opens his eyes and he's like, I can see. Pray. I can see. Praise God, I can see. And he's running around over here and there. And he is not quiet about this. Now remember, who made this guy? God did. And he put just the right temperament and personality that this guy couldn't keep quiet. He is so excited. He's running around. He's, I can see. Oh, and he's going around. And the Pharisees catch wind of this guy and said, hey, what are you doing? He says, well, I, I, I can see. Well, well, we know that. I mean, everybody can see. Well, I was blind and now I can see. And so people are looking at him and say, well, was that the same guy that was over there sitting around begging and Oh, yeah, that's him. And he, he hears the conversation, and he runs up and says, I can, it is me. I can see. And so the Pharisees are just kind of um, a little frustrated about this whole thing because, you know, Jesus has, 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 has been told that he healed him, not just healed him, but healed him on the Sabbath day, which is an interesting argument because they were really concerned about that. That somehow was, was wrong. And so they invite you know, the blind man to come in and, and uh, ask him, you know, uh, tell us, tell us what happened. And so he said, well, he reached down and he grabbed up some dirt and he moved it around like this, which really is, according to the various understandings of the law, was breaking the law, just kind of doing this. I don't get it, but they were concerned about it. And, and he put it on my eyes and told me to go over there and wash and, and now I can see. And the Pharisees were divided, and they started arguing with themselves back and forth. And this man, I'm, can you imagine, in the courtroom, this guy's like, man, look at this place over here. I mean, it was obvious that this man had, had never seen anything. I mean, he, he's just looking at, at everything. I mean, it's just, it was very obvious that he had just been healed, and he'd never seen anything before that very day. And they were divided among themselves. The Pharisees... They didn't really believe him, so they called his parents in. So the parents come in and they say, was this your son? Yes, this is our son. I mean, was he born blind? Yeah, he was born blind. So how did he receive his sight? Well, his parents knew, you know, kind of the political intrigue, and they knew that they shouldn't answer the question, because if they did, they might get excommunicated and thrown out of the church and miss out on heaven just because um, they'd answer the question wrong. And so they said, you know what? He's old enough. He's of age. You should ask him. So they bring him back in and said, young man, how did you receive your sight? He says, look, all I know is this. Once I was blind, but now I can see. And they said, well, what did he do to you? How did it happen? And the, and the man becomes frustrated. And he said, well, I already told you. And it just kind of clicked in his mind. He said, oh, what do you want to know again? Well, you want me to tell you again. Do you want to be his disciples? Oh, they, they didn't know what to do. And so they just 
they, they lost all of the good arguments they had left and just started throwing names out, called him a sinner, excommunicated him, and threw him out of the church. Jesus says that this story was for the glory of God. And I want to tell you today that this blindness, this same blindness, the thinking that God punishes people arbitrarily for sin, helped prepare the way for the Jews to reject Jesus. In the book Desire of Ages, it says this, that for the Jews to reject Jesus, he who borne our griefs and carried our sorrows was looked upon by the Jews as stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, and they hid their faces from him. They rejected the Messiah because they didn't understand the lesson of Job or what Jesus was trying to teach them. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I love Jesus' answer. Neither this man nor his parents, but that the glory of God should be revealed. And so we answer the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And I want to leave you with this, that sometimes there are no reasons. Short of heaven, short of that thousand years when we will sit down and we will record the books, short of being able to have angels come by and say, no, no, you remember the blind man? You had a question. You remember that incident where there was that accident? You remember that death that you couldn't figure out in your mind? You remember that? I want to help you answer that question. And they're going to open up to our understanding the will of God. And we're going to be okay with it. We are going to be okay with it. I don't know what pain you're dealing with right now, but I know there's a lot of it. And we're not going to know until we get there. But we're going to be okay with it because God has a plan. And he says that the glory of God is going to be revealed. And that's why the story is in the Bible. So somehow we've got to get beyond the question of why it happened. And ask yourself the question, what do I do now that it's happened? Jesus is saying that he doesn't operate in the way that people think he operates. He doesn't say arbitrarily, well, this one gets it and, and that one doesn't. He doesn't work that way. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't natural consequences for sin. There is. But I am saying that God doesn't punish people just because of a whim. There is a concept that if we continue to reject God and reject God and say no to God, that, that He is forced to let the hedge up because we're rejecting His way and His will. But there are plenty of people that we have no question, they're good people, but a bad thing happened. And there's no way this side of eternity that we'll be able to understand. And so I simply say, sometimes there are no reasons, none that we can understand on this earth. And so we shouldn't even ask the question, why? But we should ask the question, when? When things happen to good people, what am I going to do now? It's a story of a couple of men that did that. They got beyond the whys and asked, what do I do now? And uh, one of them's name was Garrison. Back in 1942, Garrison was a businessman, and he was away on business. He was traveling, and he was getting on a train to head back home, and there was an iron grid that fell on his leg, and he was taken to the hospital. A blood clot formed in his leg, and doctors came and gave him the news that in order to live, he was going to have to have his leg amputated the following day. Now, can you imagine laying there you know, you're, you're ready to get home and, and, and you were, you're getting on the train and something happened and that iron grid, we don't know why, but it fell and it, and it, and it hurt him and now he's going to lose his leg? Let me tell you, the pillow was wet with tears that night as he prayed and cried and talked to the Lord. And I'm sure he thought about his Jewish parents, Robert and Anna, as they immigrated from Lithuania. 
settled in the United States. And I'm sure Garrison thought about his father who had lost his leg and had turned gangrene and he also had lost his life and actually died. All these thoughts went through his mind, but he was alone, he was in pain, and he prayed that if God would let him live and if possible keep his leg, that he would spend the rest of his life helping others. Well, Garrison prayed a lot that night. In the morning, his pillow was soaked with tears, and he had cried as he prayed to God. And the next morning, as the doctors came in, they examined his leg, and miraculously, the blood clot had disappeared. As they monitored him there for a little bit, they, they became convinced that, that, that he was going to be okay. And they led him out of the hospital and sent him home. When he went home, he went and talked to his brother Mose, and he told him the whole story and what had happened. And you know what his brother said? His brother said this. He said, well, if that's your promise, then that's my promise too, and we're going to keep it together. Now, now who does that? First of all, we say, well, praise God, I'm so thankful, and we kind of go back to our normal life. But not for Mose. Mose says, if that's your promise, it's my promise, and we're going to keep it together. And so, the two brothers decided that there needed to be a place in the city where they would help people with amputated arms and legs and people with back injuries and people who couldn't walk and talk and play like they used to anymore. And then in 1975, Garrison's brother Mose was there in the family business when a crane dropped a piece of iron on Mose's leg. He had to be rushed to the hospital where they did amputate his leg. And he was now a patient in the same hospital that he had built for other people. And he was doing good. He was doing good for other people. And here's this freak accident, and he loses his leg. Garrison and Mose Siskin went on to build one of the premier hospitals for rehabilitation in the Chattanooga area in the southeast. It still stands here today. And it's a place where you go if you've had a stroke or whether you've had an injury or you've broken a, a limb and, and, and you need some rehabilitation. You've had a car accident and you, and you have to have rehabilitation. You go to Siskin Hospital, one of the best. And while Mose was there in that hospital, he kind of joked with the others, you know, he was always a source of encouragement and a, a source of uh, strength. And he said, well, I haven't really lost my leg. One's just a little shorter than the other. And he kept the courage of the other folk of a light heart and of courage and strength. And you look at that story and you say, why? But Garrison and Mose didn't ask the question of why, they just said, when this happens, this is what you do. He encouraged the other people that were in the place. He didn't just sit around and mope. He was wheeling that wheelchair up and down the hallway. You can go down and you can read the story. It's a true story. And I just thank God that we have men like Mose Siskin that probably had a few questions run through their minds but they worshiped God. And they just said, okay, now that this has happened, this is what I'm going to do. And they were a source of encouragement and strength to the others. So why do bad things happen to good people? Sometimes there, there is no answer. I will tell you this, that suffering is inflicted by Satan and is overruled by God for purposes of mercy. But while we're on this earth, in the midst of the tragedy, we can, by faith, pull back the curtain that separates us from the other side and see that there is an interplay between Christ and Satan. There is a controversy going on, and we are not allowed to understand the why. And so we have to, by faith, say, when this happens, I'm going to worship God. Job gave us that. Job gave us that. He says, if he slays me, if he kills me, I'm going to worship him. And that 
kind of mindset helps us to understand passages like Romans chapter 11 and verse 33 when it says, how unsearchable are your judgments and how unsearchable are your ways past finding out. Romans chapter 11 and verse 33. So while we're on this earth, we may not be able to answer the question of why and just get to the when. And if we see that God reveals himself to man, it is by shrouding himself in a thick cloud of mystery. You know, I love the last part of the book of Job, chapter 38, when his friends get tired of talking. God says, all right, now I want you to go over to Job, and he's going to pray for you because you've sinned. It's been all this time, days and days harassing Job, trying to figure out what he had done wrong. And God said, let him pray for you. And then God speaks. Don't you love it when God speaks? Notice what he said. Job chapter 38 in verse 1, and then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Ah, oh, that's interesting. He was in the thing. Out of the whirlwind. Who is this who darkens counsel? by words without knowledge. Now prepare yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched a line upon it, and to what were its foundations fastened? And who laid the cornerstone? And the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now I want to just stop for a moment and think about that. We, <laughs> by, by the miracle of science really, have sent men to the moon. And when they got up there, they turned around and they took a photograph of the earth. Now I want you to just look at that photograph for a second. We know what a foundation is. The foundation is the cement that holds the building up, Right? It's the foundation that holds the whole house up. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When astronauts got up there and turned around and looked back on earth, they found out there is no foundation. It just sits there on nothing. And he asked Job, where were you when I just put the earth out there on nothing? Nothing. Where is the dwelling? Where is the way to the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place? That you may take it to its territory or that you may know the paths to its home. Have you entered the treasury of snow? Have you seen the treasury of hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? Who has divided a channel for the overflowing of water floods or a path for the thunderbolt lightning? Who has put wisdom in the mind? Do you know who set the wild donkey free? Job. Job, stand up, answer me. Did you make the, 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 the eagle proud? Job, stand up and answer me. Stand up, Job, and answer me like a man. Job 40 and verse 1. Job answers and says, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. And so as Job listens to all of the questionings, as he listens to all of God asking him to think about this whole process, we come down to the final point, and it is there in Job chapter 40 and verse 4. And this is what he says. Job, behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Heavenly Father, help us to understand the story of Job. 
that through such terrible tragedy, such, such grief, such pain, that when you came down and in love questioned Job, where are the foundations of the earth? Tell me, tell me if you have understanding. Help us to remember that you've got this. Just like you hold the earth on nothing, you've got us. You've got our problems. You've got our situations. Father, we don't know why these things happen. We just know that when they happen, we want to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for saving us. We want to thank you for the cross. We want to invite you to come in and change our lives and prepare us for heaven and for the rest of the story when we'll know the why in time to come. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.